Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Mayor George Voinovich. Senator from Ohio. Uh, I'm Folks, honored that the President Howard has chosen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you all very much, and George, thank you for that marvelous introduction. And thanks to Bill Tilling Ask for your role in making tonight's event such a success. I'd also like to thank Bob Bennett for his help in making my day here in Ohio almost as much fun as watching Boomer hit Tim McGee right on the numbers with one of those sweet touchdown passes. <laughs> I'm happy to wind up my day in Ohio here in Cincinnati with Commerce Secretary Verity, Bill Gratison, Bob McEwen, I understand we're celebrating a birthday here, 200 years, and you had a big weekend with the tall stacks in town. And now, now most of you know I've been around for quite a while, but the Queen City still has a few years on me. George and I have spent most of the day together, and I guess his lovely wife Janet is probably a little anxious that he was getting home. You know, some people say that politics make strange bedfellows. I'm going to let you in a little secret. Sometimes politics doesn't make bedfellows at all. <laughs> and sometimes it separates people that have been bedfellows for a while. I'd, uh, I'd love to stay in Cincinnati a little longer. Everybody knows this is one of my favorite states. But frankly, I have to say I'm a little anxious to get back to Nancy myself. <laughs> you know, the government's got quite an employee there in the First Lady for no salary. But I thought I might like to tell you I'm very proud of her and what the cause that she is speaking or addressing herself to throughout the country. I know that there's a lot of talk now, and you've heard about Just Say No. I thought maybe you might be interested in hearing where that came from. Nancy was speaking to a little school group or classroom in uh, Oakland, California, and a little girl stood up and said, what do we do when someone offers us drugs? And Nancy said, Just Say No. And today, there are over 12,000 Just Say No clubs in the schools across the United States. So 
So George and Janet may be a little lonely, but they know and you know and I know that if they're seeing a little less of each other these days, it's for a very good cause. And I'm here because I want to help. Now, you all know the man I'm rooting for in the presidential election, that silver-tongued devil, George Bush. <laughs> I could have told the other guy not to get into a fight with George. <laughs> After all, look what happened when George fought for America in World War II. 58 combat missions completed. And I guess you could say that last week, George Bush completed his 59th, and it sure was a bullseye. <laughs> But as you all know, there are two Georges running this year in Ohio, and they share much more than just a name. The two Georges have the same values, the bedrock principles of family and home and community and country. The two Georges have the same goals, keeping government off the backs of the American people, keeping taxes down and keeping this nation strong and at peace. They stand opposed to the forces of weakness, accommodation, gloom, and doom. The two Georges stand as proud defenders and promoters of a vibrant economy, limited central government, strong national defense, and the American system and the American people. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I say it again. There are two Georges this year, and I don't know of a better, more able, and more principled public servant than the man who's going to be the next senator from the state of Ohio, George Voinovich. When he became mayor of Cleveland in 1979, George found the city treasury mired in debt to the tune of $111 million. On June 25, 1987, he paid off the last of that debt. A lot of people said it couldn't be done, but they didn't understand that George Voinovich is the Charlie Hustle of Ohio politics. That kind of accomplishment is what we need from our politicians in Washington. The guys who spend and spend and spend the taxpayers' hard-earned money and then have the nerve to go on television on those Sunday morning shows and complain that there's a budget deficit. Now there's something I've been going around the country saying, and I'm going to say it again tonight. The President doesn't spend a dime of the nation's money. It's Congress that appropriates, Congress that authorizes, and Congress that spins. George Voinovich knows what you know and what I know. There's a simple way to reduce a deficit, and you know how to do it. You spend less money. It's so simple, only a liberal could miss it. The only way the President can get Congress to spend less money is to veto those pork barrel bills that have so much packed into them, they end up thicker than the New York City phone book. Ladies and gentlemen, that ain't legislation. It's extortion of the taxpayers' money. And to prevent it, the President must have the same prerogative that 43 governors have. It's called the line item veto. And this country needs a constitutional amendment that will require the Congress to pass a balanced budget. But surprise, surprise, the liberals have consistently voted against the line item veto and the balanced budget amendment. The liberals oppose these measures because despite what they tell Dave Brinkley, they don't want a balanced budget. And they don't want to stop their big spending. They want pork, pork, pork. And you know what that means. It means taxes, taxes, and taxes. Well, one of the liberal tax and spend ringleaders in Washington is the fellow who's running against George Voinovich this year. The nonpartisan Washington publication, Congressional Quarterly, called him the liberal master of obstruction. Needless to say, he voted for those boondoggle bills. He's voted for so many of them, He's been given the dubious distinction of winning a Big Spender Award from the National Taxpayers Union. But the clash between liberals, like George's opponent, and mainstream America 
It's about much more than spending. It's a clash of vision, of philosophies. George Voinovich's opponent has a great deal in common with George Bush's opponent. That's why a liberal lobby that counts these things gave him a perfect 100% liberal rating. Well, when the liberals give a politician that kind of unqualified thumbs up and the voters of Ohio find out about it, I think they're going to give him a thumbs down. George Voinovich's opponent has carried his stealth candidacy to new heights by refusing to debate George even once, as he told you. And with his record, I can understand why. But no amount of hiding can obscure the fact that if anyone deserves to be tagged with the L word, it's him. So let me do it. Liberal, liberal, liberal. <laughs> On issue after issue, liberals like Ohio's premier liberal have made it clear that their values are not the values of the American people and the great Buckeye state. George and George believe we must protect the lives of those who protect us, the noble men and women who serve in state and local police. And what do the liberals, the Massachusetts liberal and the Ohio liberal believe? They oppose the death penalty, or at least the Ohio liberal did until this election. He had a sudden change of heart and decided to support it for drug kingpins. How's that for political opportunism? Who knows what he would support next year? With George Voinovich and George Bush, there is no question. They believed before, they believe now, and they will continue to believe a crack dealer who murders a police officer in the line of duty should receive death as his punishment, and I agree. A difference in values. That explains why the liberals sometimes seem to care more about the rights of criminals than the rights of honest and law-abiding Americans. You see, they oppose legislation that would allow reliable evidence, obtained reasonably and in good faith by our police, to be used in criminal prosecutions. That's the kind of position they take on crime, and they're just plain wrong to invoke the Constitution when they take it. I don't see a word in the Constitution that says crooks should go free because of a technical error. But that's what George Voinovich's opponent was saying when, until this election year, he repeatedly argued against giving police the benefit of a reasonable good faith exception. Now let me give an example, if I could, of what I'm talking about here and what maybe too many people don't understand. This thing of in good faith a policeman, a law officer does something and then finds that some technicality was not observed, and so the evidence that he has found cannot be used. The example I'll give you happened in my state, California, San Bernardino. There was a policeman who had enough evidence on a couple living in a home there to get a warrant to search that home for drugs, that these were drug peddlers. He had the warrant, he came in as a drug enforcement officer and served or, and went through the home as best he could, searching everywhere, and found nothing. And on his way out the door, suddenly he realized there was their baby in the crib. And he stopped, and he took off the baby's diaper, and there was the heroin stashed away. In court, they threw that out as evidence and freed the two people because the baby hadn't given its permission to be searched. It's now known in California and throughout much of the country as the diaper case. He changed jobs. I ran into him very closely when I first came into this job. He switched to the Secret Service. I'm glad to have him. But I thought that you might like to know this is the type of thing. This is the you know, it's almost like, they've explained it sometimes, as an automobile going through a red light and a policeman stops it for going through the red light and sees a murdered body in the back seat. He can't claim that as evidence because he only stopped him for going through a red light. Well, when you examine their views on foreign policy and defense, the differences between them, between 
the Georgias and the American people, become, or the, I mean, no, the other two, the Georgias' opponents and the American people, become even more clear. They've opposed our efforts to modernize and enhance our national security. How about the deployment of American intermediate-range missiles in Europe, the very missiles that made our INF treaty a reality? Ohio's liberals supported the nuclear freeze that would have locked in Soviet nuclear superiority. How about the MX missile? How nine, nine times his vote was no. How about this administration's efforts to protect America from nuclear attack? Twelve times his vote was no. How about the B-1 bomber, many of whose components were made in Ohio? Six times his vote was no. Earlier today, I said we're going to do all we can to make sure that people don't cancel their vote for George Bush by re-electing die-hard die liberals to Congress and sending them to Washington to make more trouble and spend more money and try to raise taxes. One example of a qualified conservative who should replace one of those liberals is, as you well know, right here in this room, the Republican congressional candidate from the first district, a great guy who would make a great representative, Steve Shabbat. We've got to get this message out. The party leaders up here with me have raised a lot of money and worked hard for our ticket this year, and they need your help in these remaining three weeks. I can't think of a better or more able crew to spread the message and fill the polling places on November, November 8th than the Hamilton County Republican Party. I'm confident you will prevail because I know Ohio. I love Ohio. Ohio came through for George Bush and me in 1980, and it came through for George Bush and me in 1984. And on November 8th, it's going to come through again. It's going to come through for the values and principles that we hold dear. On November 8th, it's going to come through for George Bush and George Voinovich, the two best Georges in the business. Now, I know that I'm keeping you from your dinner, and so that's what I get for being a before-dinner speaker. <laughs> and I just want to recognize all that you two are doing, and doing by being here. And I just I have every confidence that you're going to go all the way, and on November 8th, we're all going to be aglow with victory. I thank you all, and God bless you all. January the 11th, I had the honor of presenting you a key to the city of Cleveland, and I presented it to you, and I said, I hope that it would remind you that you were key to unlocking the door of our public-private partnerships that led to Cleveland being named an All-America City three times uh, within a five-year period. Tonight, I want to present this key to you. to remind you that Ohio is key to unlocking the door of the Democrat-controlled United States Senate, and Ohio is key to sending someone to the United States Senate that has your values and your inspiration in the United States Senate. Mr. President, thank you very much for coming.